Thank you, guys. If you will, take your Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 2, book of Acts, a series of messages entitled, as you see on the screen, A New World Coming. A New World Coming. I want you to think about it. This is where I want to start. I want you to think with me. Put on your thinking cap. I want you to think about the most favorite place you go when you go. When you go somewhere and it's your favorite place, you get excited about it. I want you to think about all the, uh, um, the things you do to get ready to go. Think about all the preparations you make, all the little things you do just to get ready. So everything's got to be right because this is going to be your trip and you're going to get excited about it and you're going to go. If you want to get me excited, you walk up to me and say, Brother Jerry, I got a couple of tickets to the Masters Tournament in, in Augusta. I'm there for you. Or even the players' championship that played last week. Just fire me up. Now, I will do a lot of things to get ready to go, things you don't know about. I'll just all kind of stuff to, to do. At the same time, if you want to walk up to me and go, and maybe this is your thing, Brother Jerry, I got a couple of tickets to Talladega. I'll probably go with you. Or Daytona. You know, I'll probably go with you, but I won't lose any sleep. I probably lost sleep by going to the Masters. or the, But I, I won't lose any sleep now. I know some this lights your fire. Some of you guys probably light your fire. We spent 10 years in Hueytown, Alabama, which is literally... The birthplace, the Bonnets, the uh, Allisons live there. and uh, um, But just watching guys drive fast and turn left has never really excited me, okay? So, uh, um, but if it's your thing, it's fine. My point is, is that golf is not better than race cars, than NASCAR, or NASCAR is not better than golf. It is that some things light my fire, some things light your fire. And whatever lights your fire is where you want to go, what you want to do. That's the point. For those who have been here, we have been working our way through the book of the Acts, and uh, uh, we're on a journey. In my, in my view, my opinion, Jesus is trying to outlay a new world for the people on earth, for his people on earth. And I ask you this, no matter where you are in your life, are you excited about where God wants to take you? Are we as a church excited about what God wants to give us? Are we excited about what God wants us to experience? Last week at the 8 o'clock hour, we were in Bay St. Louis. at Gram I was at Grammy's Donuts and more. And I was sitting there at 8 o'clock and I was eating my eggs. And don't tell Deborah, is that I was eating my eggs and my twist, glazed twist. And I had in front of me my Surface Pro, and I was watching the service here stream live, and, and I heard our own Ben Mitchell unpack Isaiah 6 in a wonderful way. He and I had talked about it. I knew what he was going to preach on, and I wanted to hear how he did, and he just did a great job. If you're not proud of our preacher, boy, I'm going to tell you I am. And uh, I, think he, I think God's going to do some great things through him. But, you know, I'm sitting there in Grammys, and you know what it occurred to me? Here's what it occurred to me, verbatim. God's done done it again. Now, all you English people, that's bad English, but it's great theology. God has done done it. Why did I say that? It's because as Ben unpacked Isaiah 6, this is what occurred to me, 66 chapters in Isaiah, but Isaiah 6 is the turning point in the life of Isaiah. The turning point in that prophecy, everything that happens for the next 60 chapters is a result of him seeing the Lord, is a result of him seeing the Lord, seeing himself in light of the Lord, is a result of himself uh, confessing his sin. One of the great things being said last week, he said, when you get in the presence of deity, all that's left to do is confess. While that's true, you can take this and put it in your notes. Here's what I'm going to tell you. Not only did Isaiah confess his sins, but when he got present of the Lord, he confessed everybody else's sin too. You see, and, 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 you can, and you can kind of pick the vibe up of Isaiah because in Isaiah 7, he goes on to say something really incredible. And I'm going to ask you, are you ready? But here's what Isaiah said. He said, if you do not stand firm in the faith, then you will not stand firm at all. Now listen to me, creakers. 
We may have some folks not from the creek today. That's fine. Here's what, here's what we know today. We know today that we try to stand on all kinds of things, both as a church and as individuals. We try to stand on past successes. We try to stand on our history. We try to stand on our financial stability and our resources, our own intellect, our own, own ingenuity. We try to stand on our traditions. We try to uh, stand on our preferences. We try to stand on our goodness. We try to stand on our personal desires. And here's what I want to say to everybody in the room. You want to stand on those things, go ahead. But here's the deal. You're almost assured failure and divine discipline if you're one of his. For almost three months, I have pushed this, us as a church family towards spiritual awakening, spiritual renewal, and spiritual revival. And we've experienced a little of that. We saw some of it at 1015. How God moved in in his grace and spoke to young people and not so young people alike. And here we come to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter Acts 2 is to Acts what Isaiah 6 is to Isaiah. It's the turning point and more. It's not just the turning point in the book of Acts. It's the turning point in humanity. It's the turning point in Christianity. It's the turning point in following Jesus. It's, it, it points us to the correct way. It's big stuff for us. But the question I want to ask today is this. It's the title of the message, as you see in your bulletin. It's, Are You Ready? Are you ready to take his trip? Are you ready for him to do something that he's never done before? Are you ready for God to lead you like he's never done before? Or are you just ready just to maintain the status quo and depend on yourself? Some place that you want to go, do you want to go with him? Do you really want to see? I mean, he created this world. He designed it. He created you, designed you. He has plans for you, and his plans greater than you can imagine. So let's get this scripture in front of us. If you have found Acts chapter 2, would you stand to honor the reading of God's word? If you don't have your Bible, it should be on the screen. I read from the Christian Standard Version. Scripture says, now when the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were all together in one place. Now let me pause there to say this. When the King James translators in 1600 and following translators, that, that uh, uh, it was important for everybody to know that they were in one accord. They were in unison. They were in harmony. They had one mind. So keep that in mind. They were all together. They were of one mind and one place. Verse 2. Suddenly. From heaven. And it filled the whole house where they were staying. They saw tongues like flames of fire that separated and rested on each one of them. Then... They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, there were Jews staying in Jerusalem, devout people from every nation under heaven. When this sound occurred, a crowd came running together and was confused. Because each one heard them speaking in his own language. They were astounded and amazed, saying, Look, aren't all these people who are speaking Galileans? How is it that each of us can hear them speaking in our own native language? Thus, the gift of tongues. Verse 9. Parthenians, Medes, Elamites, those who live in Mesopotamia, in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phygra and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts, Christians and Arabs. We hear them, we hear them declaring the magnificent acts of God 
in our own tongues. They were all astounded and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But some sneered, that means mocked, but some sneered and said, they're drunk on new wine. Let's pray together. Father, for the moments that remain, we ask you to do what only you can do. As we read your word, we know you are able to do some incredible things among us. And we ask you to do it here. We know that yes, you did and yes, you can. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. The question before us, as you see on the screen, are you ready? Are you ready? Have you made preparations? And I'm going to just tell you at the outset, it pains me, it hurts me to say this. Some will say, I'm not ready. I'm not willing. I am not interested. I just don't want to go there. And you ask, some of you will ask why. And maybe we'll get to that answer and maybe we'll touch on it. But can I, before I dive in, can I, can I ask you another question? <clears throat> Have you ever been excited about something? A trip or something, a party or something, and you invited somebody to come? You just gave them a friendly invitation, and they blew you off. Do you remember how much it hurts? And you say, Brother Jerry, you're about to invite us somewhere. Well, I've been inviting you somewhere, but here's what I want to tell you today. The Lord Jesus invites you to come on this trip. He lived and died for this whole new world. He invites all of us to come. Will you say yes? Will you say no? Will you be ready? I have to confess to you that when I read, when I read Acts 2, if you can't tell, I get excited about Acts 2. Reading Acts 2 just excites me because... <laughs> The kids didn't know what I was going to preach on. But I wrote these lyrics down. <laughs> did he move every mountain? Did he defeat every darkness? Yes, he did. And yes, he can. Do you believe that today? Here's what I want to say to you today. The reason Acts 2 excites me is because I see this experience in that first century church Yes, he did. And you know what? It reminds me that, yes, he can today. Yes, he can today. He can do it again. We've only read 13 verses, and my heart's already pumping, and, 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 and I'm already getting excited. I'm already getting tingled about what goes on and what God wants to go on. And it doesn't matter what somebody tells me. Oh, Brother Jerry, just calm down a little bit. It'll be okay. No, it won't. No, it won't for you, for you see, if God did it in his word, he can do it at New Hope. If he did it in Jerusalem, he can do it in Columbia. He can do it on Ten Mile Creek. If he did it once, he can do it again. And I believe he wants to. I believe he wants to. And I may be the only one here. Sometimes people kind of look at me with their eyes rolling back in their head. I may be the only one here, but I want God to be God. So let me get a few, let me get a few foundational facts out here for all of us, because there's many in this room today that I do not know. Jehovah God starts with him. He sent Jesus Christ, his only son, the second person in the Trinity, to live a perfect life, to die the death of a sinner in my place and in your place. So that I didn't have to die, so you don't have to die. He then spent three days in the ground, in the tomb, and then he rose again. We call that Easter these days. He rose again, and he rose again to make us right before the Father in heaven. And now he offers us eternal life. By the way, he ascended to heaven, and he is in heaven, and he's, and he's sitting at the right hand of God. And when we try to pray, and we don't know how to pray, we, we mumble what we want to say, and then Jesus is sitting by the Father, and he goes, Father, what they're trying to say, and they can't, is this. And so he intercedes for us. And then 
He offers us eternal life. How do we get that? We recognize that we're a sinner. By the way, if you don't think you're a sinner, there's no hope for you to be saved. The Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. The Bible says for all have sinned and fallen short. And the Bible says the wages, the compensation schedule, the payment for sin is death. You'll fall into death, physical death now, and you'll have eternal death in a place never designed for you. You see, God sent Jesus to save us from that. But the goal of our salvation is not heaven. The goal of our salvation is a relationship with God through Christ Jesus. And when we receive him, our lives are changed. And what we do here today, please listen, it's not just a weekend gig. It's not just, oh yeah, another meeting. It is a relationship with God our Savior as much as our young people are trying to lead us to understand that he is God and we're not. We offer him our worship. We offer him our praise. And when we, when we come to him by salvation, he becomes our Savior. He becomes our Lord. He becomes our guide. He becomes our shepherd. He becomes our everything because we lean on him. This is something we need to understand. With him, it's all or nothing. It's all or nothing. I hate to use this because it's a poker illustration but you're either all in or you fold. And he doesn't want you to fold. He invites you. you Brother Jerry, you're pretty tough about this. Well, I don't, Jesus said this. He said, whoever puts his hand to the plow and just simply looks back. He didn't say turn back. He says looks back. Not fit for the kingdom. And then that great Matthew passage where Jesus is talking about the land. And in that day, Many will say to me, Lord, Lord. And I'll say, depart from me, I never knew you. And then they talk about all the good things they've done. They talk about casting out demons and doing mighty miracles. It's not our good works, it's his grace. Do you have that kind of relationship with God today? I, I don't care what church you're a member of. Do you have that kind of relationship with Christ today? Already I can... Hear the, chi- the wheels turning and somebody going, Brother Jerry, don't go overboard. Don't go overboard. Just, just chill a little bit. My question is this. Overboard? Seriously? Is that your story and you're sticking to it? I mean, people used to lock me down with that, don't get overboard. But I'm going to tell you today, here's, the, here's, here's my heart today. Please listen. How can you o- go overboard With what is at stake? Eternity hangs in the balance. I admit to you that we're studying two books now as a church. We're walking through Acts on Sunday morning and we're walking through James every Me to the, to the, I started to say uh, to the outhouse, but he's taken me out and to the barnyard a couple of times. You got what I'm saying? Does anybody know what I'm saying here? Have you ever been taken out like that? Come on, Joe McNabb. Yes, give me a nod. There we go. Been taken out. But also, there's another book. It's a book written by a guy named Dean and Sarah. And when I read it, it's convicting, it's sobering, it's stunning. It's entitled, The Unsaved Christian. In fact, it's a book I hope to teach our, to lead our small group leaders through in just a couple of months. Because it addresses all the things that we're talking about. So, back to our scripture. I'll chase this rabbit all day long. Acts chapter 2. When you read Acts chapter 2, does it move you at all? Does it touch you at all? Does it thrill you at all? Does it excite you at all? 
Are you ready to do what God wants you to do? Some may say no, but I'm hoping you say yes. And here's what I know already as I stand here. You've already answered that question in your heart before I move forward. But let me pose this question before I jump off. If your answer is no, you're not ready to move with God. You're not ready for God to do something in your life. Not ready for us to move forward as a church. Not ready for your church to move forward. Here's a question. Not ready to be filled with the Holy Spirit. If that's true, why in the world would you want to go to heaven? Because in heaven, the Holy Spirit's going to be ruling. The Father's going to be on the throne. The Son's going to be there. It's all going to be about them. That's part of the change that comes when we come to know Christ. If you look at Acts 2, some people say, well, that's never happened since then. It's just a one-time event. And I would say to you, that's not necessarily true if you read your history and revival. First Great Awakening, Second Great Awakening, the, the prayer revival of the 1860s began in New York, the Hebrides revival. I mean, the Holy Spirit of God has, has fallen time and again. Do you know when he's fallen? It's the same time that he fell here. Are y'all ready? Here's what I'm going to tell you. This is, here is the one characteristic of when the Holy Spirit falls like that. It is, they were ready. They were ready. They had spent 10 days in prayer preparing their hearts. Their hearts were in one accord. And I want to tell you, I'm just going to lift out of this. As we end this message, I'm going to lift out three signs that tell me they were ready. If you have your bulletin there, you can write them down. If you just have a pencil and piece of paper, our young people normally write them down. Here's, there's three signs there that tell us we're ready. First of all, it is, it is the unmistakable sign. There is the unmistakable. What is the unmistakable sign? Well, you find it. In, chapter, in verse 1 of chapter 2, it says they were all together in one accord in one place. They were all together. They were together. They were all together. They were in one accord, and they were, listen to me, Baptists, listen to me, those who were visiting, they were in one place. Now, everybody in this room, this church member, knows that I pick on Baptists all the time because I are one. I, I, always, I always pick on that the people in the Bible must be Baptists when they make mistakes. And so I... You know, I pick on them all the time, but when I hear, when I read this verse, this first verse, I'm thinking maybe they're not Baptists because they were, they were in one accord. They were in one mind. There was nothing going on. But here's what I'm going to tell you. People will ask, Brother Jerry, is it important for us to all be together? Well, the scripture teaches, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as is the manner of some. God's will for us is to gather as his family. Brother Mark used this scripture, and a lot of times preachers use this scripture, and other folks use this scripture to, to uh, um, excuse poor attendance of a service or revival or something. And that is the passage that he quoted, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I'll be in the midst. Well, you, you, well that's good. Well, it, the Bible does say that. But that's a good example of us pulling the scripture out of context. Do you know what it's talking about when that scripture is used? It's not talking about corporate worship at all. It's not talking about the big gathering of the family. I'll tell you what it's talking about. It's talking about church discipline. Church discipline, let me read. I'll give you a quick course if you don't remember. You catch somebody in sin. Somebody trips and falls into sin. You are spiritual. Go to them. Tell them the sin and resolve it. Church discipline is never about kicking out. If you wind up kicking somebody out, church discipline is falling. It's just like with your kids. You're trying to bring them back into the way. And so you go there one-on-one, -on -one, and they repent, and they pray, and they get right. You want a brother, it says. But if he doesn't hear, then you carry two or three witnesses with you. Y'all got that? Two or three witnesses. You tell them the sin. If they, if they repent, pray, get right, they're good, but if not, then bring them to the church. And then that, that section concludes with this. For even back there when there were two or three together trying to work this out, God was in the midst of them even back then. You see, we get to Acts 2.1, and we see God's plan, God's will for his people. It is for us to be together. I 
tells you on many occasions how much I love our fellowship, how much I love our church. But I'm going to tell you, I really have a personal sadness. A personal sadness after being here 18 months is that we have folks that I don't see but once a month. They're here, they're there, they're gone, they're other places. How can we be all God wants us to be if we don't do what God's called us to do? Brother Jerry, you talking about jobs? No. I'm going to use the word that Sherman used this morning in the office when we were talking about this. It's distractions. As I was sitting in the office this morning, Something came to my mind, and I didn't plan to put this here before about, what time were we there, 7.30, Sherman? And it came to my mind, and it's sobering. I honestly wept when I thought about the truth of it. Topic is the NFL, football. Several years ago, a player got out of the NFL, and he had some brain injury, and he brought suit against the NFL about his concussion, the lack of protocols. That's why they take a lot more care today. They made it into a documentary, and then they made it into a movie. And this morning, I, I found the, the clip, 45 seconds. Um, when you guys turn the lights off back there, Tate, would you do that? I want you to hear this. I want you to pay attention to the man sitting behind the desk and what he has to say. What do they want? The NFL wants you to say you made it all up. I made it up. They're accusing you of fraud. If you retract, you'll be fine. This all goes away. Why, why, why are they doing this? They're terrified. Bennett Amalu is going to war with a corporation that has 20 million people on a weekly basis craving their product. The same way they put them. What do they want? The NFL wants you to say you made it all up. I made it up. They're accusing you of fraud. If you retract, you'll be fine. This all goes away. Why, why, why are they doing this? They're terrified. Bennett Amalu is going to war with a corporation that has 20 million people on a weekly basis craving their product. The same way they could. Okay, evidently we got a glitch. Let me tell you, you missed the payoff here. He says, they own that day of the week. The day of the week the church used to own, they own it now. I don't know if that stuns you. But it strikes me in the heart. You see, God's plan for us as his children month. So let me flip that. Let me flip that in fairness and balance. At the same time, there are some of us that I have watched, I have observed, as they have driven miles and miles and miles hours and hours to make sure for whatever was going on on Saturday to make sure that they didn't miss the Lord's house on Sunday. You see, the truth is the priority of gathering is an unmistakable sign that we're ready for what God wants to do. When they got together, the Holy Spirit fell. When they prayed, they got in one mind. And, and as we'll go through Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit stayed on them as long as they stayed together. So how did this Holy Spirit come? Let me give you the second sign. Not only the unmistakable sign, but the second was the unexpected sign. What's the unexpected sign? Well, they knew that, that something was going to happen. Verse 2 tells us that suddenly, without warning, all of a sudden, Unexpectedly, there came from heaven. 
They didn't come from home. They didn't come from grannies. They didn't come from work. They didn't come from someplace else. They came from heaven. My stars. Wouldn't you love to have been there? I'd have loved to have been there and, and been there when it came from heaven. It would have been exciting to be there as they were celebrating Pentecost. Pentecost. Pentecost is 50 days after, after the Passover. The Passover is celebrated about when the, the death angel passed over the, the, Egypt, the uh, Jewish people back in Egypt. And 50 days later, they celebrate Passover. In the Jewish custom, it was one of the great meals. It was one of the great banquets. It was one of the greatest feasts of all times. It was also celebrated as the time, watch this. It was also, Pentecost was also celebrated as the time when God gave Moses the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. Isn't it fitting that God gave the Spirit, gave the law on Pentecost, and he sent the Spirit on Pentecost? I want you to get this in your mind. Let me, let me just run this over you just for a second. As they bowed their heads in that upper room, all of a sudden, unexplainedly, a little wind began to blow over them. And then that wind began to increase, moving across them. And then it got so strong that it was a sound of a tornado or a hurricane and their hearts begin to flap, and their clothes begin to blow in the wind as the Spirit of God blew over them. Suddenly they heard, they heard, there was the sound. Suddenly they saw the tongues of fire. Suddenly they felt the room being filled with the presence of God. And then they were filled collectively as those tongues settled, not, not just in the room totally, but it settled on each one of them individually. Fire was falling from heaven. Roy Fish, professor at Southwestern, said, if the fire is falling, get close to the flames. My prayer is, Lord, do it again. Yes, he can. Yes, he did. Some ask why this doesn't happen. Let's just be. Let's... Some theologians will say, well, it's not ever going to happen again. It's a one time event. What I'm going to tell you is the first time event. It had happened the first time before it could happen a second time or a third time. I had a dear friend to say to me, I don't believe God works today like he did in days of old. And I said, well, I do. I can't find a word in Scripture that tells me I'm, my God's powerless today. And he said, well, how do you explain then that he's not working today like he did back then? To which I simply said, I don't think the problem's with God. You see, brothers and sisters, I am convinced and convicted that God wants to do it again. But I'm afraid his people are not ready I'm afraid his people don't want it and certainly are not willing. It might mess up our, our comfort. Brother Tommy Mitchell, my pastor where I moved from, said, you know, you can preach whatever you want to your people and they'll love it if it's based on the scripture. But when you start asking them to, to apply it and to change, you'll get in trouble. The signs that they were ready, are we? The unmistakable sign, the unexpected sign, and the unforgettable sign, the last sign. Unforgettable. As you read this story, you come to understand that they didn't have to do, they didn't have to do an outreach program. Are you listening to me? They didn't have to have a night of visitation. They didn't have to structure a program for people to to share. Here's what happened. When God worked in their lives, when God worked in their building, it was the sound of the workings of God that attracted people automatically. And they came, and they were confused because lost people, people outside of Christ, 
don't understand the workings of God. And they were, and the power and the words automatically. Automatically, they just begin to tell the wonderful things of God. And they didn't have to seek out the, the, in, the uh, uh, opportunity because God just poured it into their lap. You see, when you get next to the Father, when you get filled with the Spirit, you don't have to work at those things. All you have to do when you get filled with the Spirit is be faithful and He will make you fruitful. You can't be faithful and not be fruitful. Read John chapter 15. If you're faithful, you'll be fruitful if you're filled up with the presence and power of God. Here's the thing we don't like. It's that next to last verse. Or the last verse. Some mocked them, sneered, made fun of them. We don't want that. But I want you to hear this. I want you to hear this. They mocked them, they sneered at them, and they made fun of them. And they said, these guys are drunk. These guys are drunk. And you know what? They were right. But they were not drunk on alcohol. They were not under the influence of alcohol. They were under the influence of the Holy Spirit. They were drunk on the Holy Spirit. Be not drunk on wine, but be drunk. Be filled with the Spirit. Be drunk with the Spirit of God. So that the Spirit, not the alcohol, not anything else, controls you. Folks, there is a new world coming. And it's going to come whether you like it or not or whether you're in it or not. We are moving probably toward the destruction of planet Earth. We are moving toward the destruction. But let me tell you something. There is a new heaven and a new earth one day. That's where he's moving us to. Where will you be when that happens? You see, this new world is not, is not Jesus changing your heart so you're just kind to your neighbor and you make the Sunday gig and what have you. It is a life-changing event where you're under the influence of the Spirit of God. Being filled with the Spirit. So here we are as I end. You may not want to respond, and that's fine. I'm giving everybody fair warning. For those who haven't been to New Hope in a while, I have to kind of give our folks fair warning if I want them to respond. So here's a question for you. Do you believe we serve a big God? Few of you do. Do you really believe he's able? Do you believe he will? Do you believe he can? Do you believe his way is best? Now be careful here. Do you believe his way is best for you? You see, the truth is, If you believe that, then the question is, are you ready? Are you ready to hear what he wants to do? Are you ready to feel what he wants to do? Are you ready to see what he wants to do? It begins with salvation. Trust in Jesus. Jesus is making a change in your life. You believe in Jesus. You receive in Jesus. You follow in Jesus. And by the way, I have to say this. Jesus is the second person in the Trinity. He is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, and he is the only way to heaven. It's Jesus and nothing else. Amen. The 120 believers in Acts 2 believe he would and he could, and he did. The world. Those who have repented and confessed and now walk with him, received him, those folks are a part of the new world. To walk with him is to be filled with the one that's promised to you. That is the one of the Spirit of God. I'm going to say this, and I didn't say it first hour. I have discovered a new app on the phone. It's not cheap. It's not inexpensive. It's called Speechify. Has anybody heard of that? What it is, is that it'll read books for you. And you can turn that sucker up like you can Audible. You may read. I may read three pages an hour. This thing reads, can read. Whatever I put in myself is what comes out of myself. 
If I put in garbage of this world, I will never walk in the Spirit. If I take that speechify, and I, as I was listening to Dwight L. Moody, <clears throat> wait and wanting, whew, powerful. If I listen to some of Dean and Sarah's book, The Unsaved Christian, all of a sudden, what's going in is finding root. What are you putting in your life today? You know, whatever you put in. Let me give you the biblical principle, and we'll end. Whatever a man sows, he'll also reap. If you sow into your body things of this world, that's what you'll receive, things of the flesh. If you sow into your body and your mind things of the spirit, you'll receive life. How about you today? Let's pray.